welcome you all dear members i welcome dr c anbarasu ima state joint secretary and vice president of state medical cell bjp and i welcome dr l yashoda national secretary ima cgp headquarters first ima prayer ellorum magizhvudan vaala ellorum nalamudan vaala vali ennum tholle neenge allal seiyum innal neenga peraase pradibayan agatri பினிப்போக்கம் பெரும் பணி ஆற்றுவோம் பிசிஷியன் பிரேயர் பை டாக்டர் பிரேமாவதி குட் மார்னிங் எவ்ரி ஒன் மருத்துவரின் பிரார்த்தனை எல்லாம் வல்ல இறைவா உலகின் சிறந்த மருத்துவன் நீயே உன்னை மந்தியிட்டு வணங்குகின்றேன் உன்னிடமிருந்து நல்லதும் சிறந்ததும் என்னை அடைய பிரார்த்திக்கிறேன் எனது கரங்களுக்கு திறமையை தாரும் எனது மனத்திற்கு தெளிவான பார்வையை தாரும் இருதயத்திற்கு இரக்கத்தையும் கனிவையும் தாரும் எனக்கு அளிக்கப்பட்ட சிறப்பு தகுதியை தக்க வைக்க வேண்டும் வாடும் மக்கள் படும் பாட்டினை சிறிதளவாவது போக்கிட ஒன்றுபட்ட எண்ணத்தையும் வலியும் தாரும் என் மனத்திலிருந்து தகாத எண்ணங்களையும் உலக அளவு ஆசையையும் அறவே ஒதுக்கி பணி செய்து அருளுமாறு குழந்தை போன்று உன்னை சார்ந்து வேண்டுகின்றேன் தேங்க்யூ பிரேமா நம்ம பிரசிடென்ட் இருக்காராங்க கம்மியான மாதிரி பிரசிடென்ட் இருக்காரா இல்லையா ஓகே ஐ வெல்கம் டாக்டர் அன்பரசு டு சேஸ் ஸ்மால் ஸ்பீச் थैंक यू मैडम गुड मॉर्निंग टू एवरीबॉडी ऑन बिहाफ ऑफ स्टेट स्टेट ब्रांच ஐ வெல்கம் யூ ஆல் and um, especially my thanks goes to uh, dr jamna madam who has invited me for this and uh, and dr uh, raghuram rao and uh, dr cs shetty for all of you uh, my best wishes are there and uh, especially madam esoda with all her busy schedule in spite of all the national uh, cgp schedule she has spared her time uh, i must really thank her for all the work uh, she is doing a wonderful job in uh, cgp so her advice will be really useful today and uh, and uh, especially i thank uh, dr anand krishna sivaraman who is an urologist and uh, who is going to give you a excellent talk and uh, dr kumaran shanmugam is a diabetologist both of them are going to uh, give you a lot of information and uh, i hope uh, this information will be useful uh, especially the pulumli high road branch will be always uh, very good in uh, cme programs so even though it's a corona period they don't want to miss the cme that's how they have arranged that shows the enthusiasm and the uh, interest what they are showing in the medical field and uh, uh, so i want you during this period i want you to be more careful see today our national president has given a data 196 uh, doctors uh, died because of corona it seems so we i request you all to be safe and uh, uh, see to that you all you and your family is safe first and uh, ensure that you are uh, safe that is going to, because if you are safe only you are going to help the uh, in mass and the public so on behalf of uh, state uh, branch and uh, dr uh, uh, our uh, uh, vice president is uh, not able to uh, um, rajshekhar is not able to attend today because he is in a government meeting so he has informed me that he is unable to meet if at all possible he will join in between uh, i want the entire cme program to be very successful it will be useful to you thanks a lot again for uh, dr uh, anand krishnan and uh, kumaran for their uh, uh, excellent participation and the uh, uh, information what they are going to give on behalf of ima i thank both of you sir thank you very much madam jamuna madam and all the ima pondamali branch prema vandi and uh, dr girija dr reka everybody i thank for giving me this opportunity thank you very much madam thank you thank you thank you very much sir i welcome uh, dr jayaraman and uh, dr shanta madam from chennai south and vilivakam and i welcome uh, dr yashoda to give a small speech 
arranged by my classmate dr jamuna rani who is the secretary of ima punnimali high road thank uh, dr raghuram sir and shetty for inviting me for this occasion and very special the good words by dr anwar su sir he is also very principal not only in the ima session plus in the other political side also he seems to be very active now congrats to you sir and i also feel happy to see my friends dr girija dr premavati my classmate um, and the other members from like dr jayaram sir dr shanta narayanan uh, dr um, um, i think i have not left anybody i suppose uh, i'm happy to see all them zoom i think uh, at this uh, level the zoom is important for us to enrich no, our no sir no that is safely and i also congratulate the curie hospitals uh, dr kumalan uh, shamugam sir and anantha anantha krishnan for their delivers for oh. today's topic no, i think sir. do well i have already heard uh, their speeches mm-hmm. earlier on mm-hmm. and thank you again to anna rani who has invited me for this occasion she also was doing very well last year but this year uh, on the doing programs and more uh, programs like this for members i think the online classes will be the night we recognize the night we recognize in the mci also they are also been fighting for this if once it gets recognized i think it will be more helpful for all the doctors thank you once again for the occasion thank you ma thank you thank you yashoda yeah. and uh, this is the long uh, long time pending uh, cma uh, yeah. uh, which has to be done by dr sivaram uh, anantha krishnan sivaram and and uh, actually we have to celebrate this in uh, month of uh, march somehow uh, during this lock uh, lockdown period we couldn't do this uh, program now now he has come forward to do this uh, on uh, online program so i welcome uh, curie hospital to take over yes thank you madam anand krishnan sivaraman is a consultant urologist laparoscopic and neuro oncologist and robotic surgeon at chennai urology and robotics institute hospital omr chennai he is also an honorary faculty member at the university of central florida dr anantha krishnan sivaraman completed his basic medical schooling at madras medical college his urological training mch was also at madras medical college where he stood first in the mch university examinations and was awarded the professor rajashekaran gold medal in urology further training in neuro oncology and minimally invasive surgery was completed in england at the whittington and university college hospital london and eastbourne district general hospital eastbourne he also completed his fellowship in the royal college of surgeons of edinburgh he then completed his robotic surgery fellowship training at the global robotics institute the premier institute for robotic surgery training in orlando florida from 2012 to 2012 under the tutelage of professor vipul patel at florida and as consultant urologist at apollo hospitals and director at chennai urology and robotics institute he has performed more than 1000 robotic surgeries Dr Anantha Krishnan Sivaraman specializes in minimally invasive robotic surgery and neuro oncology. He is also a national proctor for robotic surgery in India, running a fellowship program for robotics as well as one of the few robotic surgeons in the world to have performed a robotic renal transplant surgery. He has several publications in peer-reviewed journals 
and has served as a managing editor for the Journal of Robotic Surgery from 2010 to 2012. He has authored book chapters on robotic surgery and robotic training. He is also faculty in University College London Robotic Center for the Advanced Urological Robotic Course, as well as faculty in Society of Robotic Surgery. Dr. Ananta Krishnan Sivaraman has been conferred a Special Achievement Award in Robotic Surgery by the Bengal Urological Society at the Bengal Urology Society Conference as part of their 50th anniversary celebrations held in Kolkata. Dr. Ananta Krishnan's passion is to help prostate cancer patients lead better lives and to this effect, he has conducted several national and international camps to raise awareness and educate people about prostate cancer. Dr. Ananta Krishnan is best known for pioneering robotic surgery in South India. Dr. Ananta Krishnan is also the founder director of the Indian Prostate Cancer Foundation, an NGO dedicated to elevation of suffering from prostate cancer in India. Before we hear, hear Sir address us on the recent advances in robotic urology, presenting you a video on Chennai Urology and Robotics Institute Hospital. We do hope you can visit us sometime. Welcome to Curie Hospitals, where robotics enhances a human touch. Established in 2018, Curie is located on OMR at Torrey Parkham. Curie Hospital's design, built to NAPH standards, is inspired not just by the need of its patients, but by the needs of their caregivers too. Which is why, as you walk into Curie, you will find every space ergonomically designed and environmentally inspired. A truly green experience. Curie is a 75-bed facility and one of Tamil Nadu's standalone single speciality hospitals for the treatment of renal diseases. What it means to be a single speciality hospital is that our expertise and focus is never diverted. All our facilities and staff are focused, trained and dedicated to a single purpose so that we can deliver the best possible medical care for your needs. Our hospital is designed to cater to all social strata economically so that no patient will be denied excellent medical care at the time of need. But as the saying goes, a hospital is only as good as its doctor's skills. Which is why we are proud that we have specialists on board, singularly focused on our speciality, urology. To back up and support the skills of our specialists, Curie has the best cutting-edge technology available in all facilities, be it CT scans, ultrasound, neurodynamics, dialysis, or just a simple x-ray, and of course, robotics. This ensures that every patient will get the best care with the best technology to back it up. Curie also has a plethora of the best qualified doctors who combine medical expertise with experience. What enhances this expertise is our new robotics technology, which adds a new dimension to assurance and reliability. Robotics in surgery increases better outcome for the patients, taking care and eliminating even small factors like a hand tremor. Curie has invested heavily in this new age technology and the results have been remarkable. With a commendable success rate, we are already heading towards being a reckoning force in urology in India. Now let's step back a minute and think. Technology and skills apart, a hospital has to be about being humane. Which is why our CSR program supports and houses the Indian Prostate Cancer Foundation and the Dementia Daycare Center with specially designed spaces for both. A 
our multi cuisine canteen, backed by inputs from our dietitians, and kiosks spread across every floor ensure patient comfort with a variety of food and caters to the need of their caregivers. Curie is committed to ensuring total comfort and care for its patients and caregivers. Curie, integrity and commitment towards patient care, backed by medical expertise. Curie, robotics with a human touch. So we welcome Dr. Anantakrishnan Shivaraman sir to give away his speech. Good morning. Um, thank you. Uh, first and foremost, thank you to the IMA Purnamali uh, branch for uh, giving me this opportunity. And uh, I must say, uh, it's always a pleasure to address uh, IMA members. And uh, I, I always feel that IMA is the backbone of our uh, medical fraternity throughout, throughout India. And uh, it is always a pleasure to come and talk to you. And for the, uh, my, may I suggest a few uh, points before we start? I would suggest that uh, till we finish the lecture, uh, all of the participants uh, mute their microphones and uh, so that uh, the, the bandwidth is not uh, uh, lost when we talk. And if possible, also you can stop your videos if, if, it's, if it's okay. So uh, today's topic is about advances and overviews in robotics. And uh, I'm, I'm very happy that a plethora of uh, senior members are here to listen to us well, whilst uh, I give this talk. So um, you've all seen this uh, small video about Curie Hospital. It has actually been a passion of mine and my father's to start a standalone single specialty renal sciences hospital that uh, does the best in urology, nephrology, and uro-oncology. So it is one of our small steps is, uh, towards this is uh, the Curie Hospital. And I think the more important thing is how we perform over the years. And uh, so to that effect, uh, every part of our uh, uh, patient, uh, you know, whenever we meet patients is protocol driven. So all of this protocol will be, uh, if you look at the Curie's website, most of the protocols will be in place. So if a patient comes to us and he's being managed in a particular way, it is all based on a protocol that we've looked at the guidelines and over years of experience, we've uh, devised such a protocol for our patients. So that is one of our main goals in uh, initiating this uh, Curie hospital. And also it serves as a training center for robotics. Uh, in India, we have more robots than training centers for robotics. So actually Curie serves as one of the training centers where people come and do fellowships in robotic surgery. And I think it, as, as a part of our initiative to foster robotic surgery, this training plays a very, very important role. So without further ado, I'll head into uh, the uh, talk. So I'll give you a small overview of where did robotic surgery start from? You know, the term robot and so on. So it, in, it didn't start uh, 20 years ago. It actually started uh, centuries ago. And how many centuries ago is several centuries. So between, you know, there are three, we can divide this into three uh, uh, particular uh, eras. One is imagining of robots. You know, imagination has always been uh, uh, in, in humankind, this differentiates itself from animal kind by imagining. And this imagination robots was from 270 BC to 1949. And from 1949, you had the birth of industrial robots. And from 1980, the robotic era in medicine took off. So uh, if, I, if I quickly uh, give you an idea, this was 270 BC. This was actually a, a water clock that was there, pro probably the first uh, iteration of what could be considered as a robot. And uh, then Leonardo da Vinci's Mechanical Knight, 
It was actually a functioning uh, mechanical knife that was done in the year 1495 by this great uh, uh, artist and scientific thinker, the Leonardo da Vinci. And in fact, the current robot is called the Da Vinci System and it's primarily named after this gentleman. So that was in 1495, somebody had the idea to manufacture a, manufacture a mechanical knight. And then the origins of the word robot, it is actually a play by a Czechoslovakian uh, playwright. And uh, it, 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 uh, it, the robota means laborer. So somebody who can do our job for us continuously without getting tired, something like that. So, and then again, historical robots, when you look at historical robots, you have uh, the MIT robot from US and Puma and ADAPT. And I'll show you examples of these. So this was in 1959, a computer assisted uh, robot that was way back in 1959, which was initiated and could do several movements. And these were the basis of how we kind of, now we've moved far ahead of uh, the 1959 robot. But at that time, it was a major step forward. So, and then came the industrial robots. So this is in 1978, a programmable universal manipulation arm. It's called Puma, programmable universal manipulation arm. So if you go to all the car factories and all that nowadays, this is the most, you know, the, the main kind of robot that you will see in, um, in most factories. This can be programmed to, to perform a particular task hundreds and thousands of times without getting tired. And uh, it, it has got very little error, uh, primarily because it can be focused to millimetric precision or less than micrometric precision. So these were, these, this is the current uh, robot that you see in most car factories or industrial factories and so on. Okay. So the next one is this ADAPT robot, again, a North American uh, company. And nowadays these companies, the robotic companies are everywhere, you know? So people initially, there was a bit of a fear that these robots will take over jobs and so on and so forth, but that hasn't happened. The robots, you know, in factory settings, the robots have reduced the amount of workforce that's needed, but a lot of people are still, uh, the robots per se haven't uh, uh, reduced the amount of uh, work as needed. There are other, aspects that take over and primarily, so we don't have to be afraid of robots taking away all our jobs or something like that. At least not doctors, not yet. So again, small, these are again, once they were in the industrial setting and then they came into the home setting, these robots are manufactured by Sony and then this, this Asimo robot by Honda. All these things are robots that have come into the home setting now. Now you also see robotic vacuum cleaners and so on that can navigate themselves in, within uh, the house to completely, uh, uh, you know, uh, do the vacuum cleaning jobs and so on. Again, these are small steps that uh, the industry has taken to alleviate some of the uh, daily mundane works that we've done. And this slowly crept into the medical field as well. So medical applications in terms of uh, prosthetic arms, robotic arms that could do based on uh, impulses from the brain have all become a reality now. Okay. So what about the medical robot? It was an uh, American government funded program, Stanford University's program in the late 1980s. And the concept was, they, you know, the American army had for every thousand soldiers, it had one doctor. So if a soldier got injured in the battlefield and you send the doctor to treat him, imagine the doctor getting hurt, right? So you had only a limited amount of doctors that could treat the soldiers. So they wanted the soldiers to be treated, but the doctor staying hundreds of miles away. So that was the idea of in the, introducing the robot. So the original concept was to perform remote surgery in the battlefield, right? So again, uh, then other aspects came in. You could transport drugs, especially in this Corona time. You know, these things are very useful. You can send drugs to patients with the robots and then they pick it up from the trolley and so on. That is possible. But this was in, invented way, way back, uh, uh, you know, compared to the pandemic that we have now. But it's still something that can be used even now. Okay. And uh, there was rounding robots as well. So this is especially very good to use in, in the Corona uh, time. 
Uh, this is the robot that goes to each and every patient's room. And there's a TV screen where uh, the doctor's face is there. It's like I'm doing a Skype call with the patient, but the robot goes to the patient's room and then a Skype, Skype call happens. But, you know, it didn't succeed primarily because the patients wanted to see the doctor. They wanted to be uh, examined by the doctor and so on. And that was no way possible by this kind of a robot. So this is something that didn't work out. But in the pandemic time, I think this will have a resurgence. Something like this will have a resurgence. Because uh, every day you need to talk to patients, but you don't necessarily need to go into the room every day to see them. Um, so that's something that I think will have a resurgence, but let's see how it goes. Right? So again, let's talk about, so we've talked about evolution of uh, robotics and let's talk about evolution of surgery per se. Right? So this, this is, a, you, all of you know Sushrita and uh, this was 1500 BC. In fact, we Indians can claim to have had the original surgeon in our midst and uh, in, in, in our land. And slowly things evolved to such a, such a level of robotic surgery being done. So evolution of surgery, this is in France and 1600s where these instruments were used to remove stones from the patient. And you can all see that there are two or three people holding down the patient because there was no anesthesia those days. Otherwise, the patient would run away. Right? So one person performing and two or three people holding down the patient. Next is introduction of anesthesia. This is 1800s. Uh, this was in, again in Massachusetts. And ether anesthesia was introduced. So you didn't have this need to hold down the patient when surgery was being done because you could give him anesthesia. But then still patients were dying because of infection. And then this gentleman with the, this is the Professor Lister with this aseptic technique and carbolic acid with a simple uh, thing where we surgeons had to wash their hand or doctors had to wash their hand with carbolic acid before they go, went into seeing the next patient, he reduced the, the infection rate so much. And then antibiotics came in and then we could do any surgery. So we had the instruments, we had uh, anesthesia, and then we had antibiotics and uh, aseptic technique to perform major surgery. And then everything could be done. Actually, this is a transplant being done by my father. Um, and uh, the era of big surgeons, great surgeries, and uh, you can put out anything, take back anything, and so on. That was what was happening. But the lives were definitely being saved, but we were making huge incisions. Right? And patients already who are sick only come to us. And if we make a bigger incision to make them better, I don't think it serves the purpose. So our goal was to do the exact same thing we were doing, but with minimizing the infections. And that's where laparoscopy came inside. So then once laparoscopy came into the picture, then things started improving. So there are huge benefits. Blood loss was reduced, complications were reduced. There's a shorter hospital stay and faster recovery, less scarring and so on. But laparoscopy has significant limitations. And what are the limitations? One is it doesn't have depth perception. So in our country or anywhere in the world, people with one eye will not be allowed to drive. And the reason is you don't have depth perception if you don't have binocular vision. So laparoscopy is three-dimensional uh, environment being projected in a 2D screen. So that was one limitation. Nowadays, it's, you, know, you also have 3D laparoscopes. But then hand tremor. Again, if I hold a pin in my hand and then hold it uh, further away, you will have tremor at the tip. So the same thing with laparoscope as well. Because the instruments are long and you're holding it at one end, it will have a tremor at the tip. And it's a bit difficult to learn. So like, like, and ergonomically uncomfortable as well. So again, these are the limitations of laparoscope. So we wanted the accuracy and comfort of open surgery, but we also wanted the minimally, uh, minimal invasions, uh, in, in incisions of laparoscopic surgery. Tamil, there is a primary surgery. Open surgery, the same comfort level of open surgery, but small incisions. So we wanted that. 
uh, see, so we, the, the solution was robotic surgery. So that's where robotic surgery scores over laparoscopy, there's improved visualization, instrument control, seven degrees of freedom and superior ergonomics, you sit down and operate. And that is what we are trying to achieve. Right? So what are the advantages? One is I spoke to you about binocular vision. Yes, so you see two cameras. All robot, these robot, the Da Vinci robot comes with two cameras and we have three dimensional vision. And this is so important for us to do surgery when we are looking through a camera because it gives us that depth perception. So I know where exactly the important stuff is that I need to cut. Uh, the next is instruments are as small or even smaller than laparoscopes. And the main advantage of this robot is that there is wristed instrumentation. So laparoscope doesn't have this ability to use your wrist. And uh, this in robotics, you have this ability to use your wrist. So I think this is one of the major advantages of robotic surgery. And, uh, and that's why it's enabled us to perform surgeries that are very difficult with laparoscopy in, in uh, robotic surgery. So another advantage I said is, uh, laparoscope carries about four times magnification. Robotics is 10 times magnified and then wristed instrumentation, as well as uh, a seven degrees of freedom of movement. So if I move my hand, I cannot do it 360 degrees, but with the robot, I'll be able to do it 360 degrees. So that's one of the advantages as well. So a lot of people ask me, a, <coughs> I'm sorry, a lot of people ask me a question uh, whenever we talk about robotic surgery is, is the robot performing the surgery or is the doctor performing the surgery? Just one second. Sorry. <clears throat> so the answer to that question is uh, the robot is though the term a robotics instills in you that it can automatically perform surgeries. It is a master slave mechanism. What we do outside gets translated inside the abdomen. So again, small video to show that. So what we do outside exactly happens inside the abdomen. So with millimetric precision. And then there's tremor filtration. Suppose, suppose my hands are shaking, right? That tremor gets filter, filtered when I'm doing surgery. When laparoscope, it won't get filtered. And then because of the magnification and the small instrumentation, and, we'll, and it is immersive field. So only if I put my eyes inside this uh, uh, vision card that you see, which, which means I'm immersed inside the patient. So when I put my head, I see exactly what is there inside the abdomen. So that's one of the key advantages for robotic surgery. So there's no disturbance. I can't see a nurse, I can't see my assistants, but I can hear them. But when I put my head inside, I see only inside the abdomen. So it's a very focused field that allows us to see what exactly we need, not anything beyond that. And um, so this is the current system that we have, the Da Vinci surgical system. There's several iterations of the system and they are all more or less equal in their functionality. So I'll give you a typical example of how a robot is docked. Imagine the leg of the patient is away from us and the head of the patient is towards us. And this is how the robot, we've already put ports that are similar to laparoscopy. And this is how we uh, connect the patient. So the robotic arms get connected to the patient. They're covered with the plastic covers because of uh, maintaining asepsis and these sterile covers have to be put on the robot. And then once we connect the robot, it just takes about two minutes for us to connect the robot, as you can see. So after putting ports in laparoscopy, we'll directly put the instrument. In robotics, there is this two minute process where we put the instruments, put the camera, and then go ahead. So the difference in time between laparoscopy and robotics in docking the patient is exactly about two minutes to three minutes, and then you can get uh, start doing surgery. Once the camera goes inside and the instruments goes inside, all you need to do is go and sit on the console and start operating. So when we are sitting on the console and uh, operating, all I, I can see as a console surgeon is what, I, what the camera shows me. But robotic surgery cannot be performed with the help, without the help of assistance. So I need a person sitting, standing next to the patient putting the instruments inside and the nurse helping that doctor as well. So it is a teamwork. It is not just one surgeon doing a process. I always need a team when I'm doing robotic surgery. 
right? So why is it so important for urology and this robotic surgery? And that is because of this, uh, if you look at uh, the prostate, it is deep inside the pelvis. So if we, if we put our hand inside, you will feel the prostate, but you won't see the prostate. But if, if you're able to see the prostate and operate, it's only with a minimally invasive surgery, you can do it. So in, in, in the 90s and 2000s, robotic surgeries you know, was, was being uh, evaluated. At 2000, the first robotic surgery was done. And the same thing happened for prostate. 1992, PSA was found. And then slowly, the amount of uh, um, CA prostates that were diagnosed started increasing. So if you look at PC mark, prostate cancer mortality rates in India, in Asia, it's very low, but compared to America. But if you look at incidence to mortality rates, it's pretty high, which means if Indians get prostate cancer and if we don't treat it early, there's a good chance they may die because of it. So likelihood of dying from prostate cancer is higher for us than the Americans, though their incidence is higher. So that's something that we need to keep in mind. And because of the PSA being introduced, because PSA is being, um, you know, it's, it's relatively cheap in India, around 500 rupees, you can get a PSA test done. And if you're, if a lot of people, because they get the test done and then we get early prostate cancer, this robotic surgery is really picked up all over the world. Right? So I get asked this question a lot. Uh, especially uh, by practitioners who should get a PSA test done, right? So uh, can India offer a screening program? In America, there was a screening program and then it was uh, ditched halfway you know, in the last four or five years and then they restarted it and so on. So who should get a PSA done? That's a question that's important for us to answer. Number one is anybody above the age of 40 walking into your clinic with any signs of low urinary tract gets a PSA test done. Anybody above the age of 40 with a family history of prostate cancer gets a PSA test done. Anybody above the age of 50, irrespective of whether they have symptoms or not, should get a yearly PSA test done. So in India, we cannot do a screening protocol, but what we can do is something called an opportunistic screening. And because IMA members and our general practitioners are the backbone of the medical fraternity in India. If we get this into our psyche that prostate cancer is a potential problem that can be completely cured if detected early, then this PSA screening should come into our way of thinking. So even when I came back from the US in 2012, even master health checkups being done did not have PSA screening. But now slowly you see a lot of master health checkups for people above the age of 15, introducing PSA screening as well. So I think it needs to be done above, above the age of 40 if they have symptoms of low urinary tract, above the age of 40 if they have family history, and above the age of 50, 45 or 50, irrespective of symptoms. So the prostate is way down inside the pelvis. And as you can see, you, if you put your hand, you will not be able to see the prostate and so on. So I'll give you a small picture. Sunday morning, hope uh, all of you can take this uh, video. And this is what you see here is uh, the dorsal vein complex. This is way below the pubic bone. And what you see here is us tying the dorsal vein complex. Now, people who have done this in open surgery and laparoscope can tell you that this step is very difficult to do in open surgery because you'll not be able to see this point. But you only feel this area and then put that stitch. And here you can see exactly where you put the stitch. Uh, and you can tie as well as you can or even better than you can tie in open surgery in this particular instance. So you see us completely uh, occluding the dorsal vein. And this is the vein that carries most of the blood back from the penis, the dorsal vein complex. And it can bleed like anything. Within about five minutes, you can or two minutes, you can lose about a liter of blood if this starts bleeding. And because you're able to comp uh, ligate this very easily with robotic surgery, I think it's again. I'm just trying to project some of the advantages of robotic surgery. And the main advantages are our ability to see very close to the organ of interest. Number two is the vision. 10 times magnified three-dimensional vision. 
and the instrumentations that are restricted that allow us to work in small spaces. So one other key advantage is here I'm doing a suspension stitch. In laparoscope, you want to stay away from uh, where you're operating so you get a wide field of vision and then you see your instrument going in. In robotic, it's slightly different. You go much closer to the organ of interest and then you see that and operate. So that's one of the key advantages here as well. So I'll quickly move on. So <clears throat> a lot of patients, even doctors ask me this question. How does robot improve outcomes? Now, uh, you know, in Adair Cancer Institute for a long time, um, the concept was, uh, they used to ask us uh, when we're doing robotic surgery, does the robot improve the longevity of a patient? And the short answer to that is no. Uh, because the robot doesn't do anything far different when you compare it to open surgery. What we do in open surgery is being done in a minimally invasive way. But the robot, if you just look at longevity, we are missing the point. Longevity along with quality of life is what matters. You know, 20 years ago, 30 years ago, when I was studying in Madras Medical College, um, can, when, when we talk about prostate cancer or bladder cancer or kidney cancer, the only goal was cancer removal. They didn't care about the quality of the patient after that, how well he fared and so on. So all they wanted was longevity. But now that is no longer enough. Is longevity along with quality of life of the patient is what you need to consider. So how does the robot improve outcomes? And, and uh, when we talk about prostate cancer, we talk about trifecta, which is cancer control, continence, and function. And in every way, the robot improves outcomes when you compare it with open surgery. So when we're doing this procedure, the important entity here is the neurovascular bundle. If you're able to save the neurovascular bundle, then your continence and potency is preserved. And I'm going to show you a small video of how the robot preserves the neurovascular bundle when we're doing prostate cancer surgery. So it's mainly used for uh, uro-oncology, where we do uh, prostate radical prostatectomy for prostate cancer, partial nephrectomy for kidney cancer, and radical cystectomy as well. So again, oncology, uro-oncology, done in a minimally invasive manner. So you see, if you see the small video, uh, here you see this video. I'll just quickly show you that uh, point here. There you go. So this is the prostate here, this side. And here what you see is the neurovascular bundle. If you saw the previous slide, the yellow uh, structures that went, that is the neurovascular bundle. Because they magnified 10 times, we can very easily see where the neurovascular bundle is. This is the neurovascular bundle. A millimeter towards the right, you will get into cancer. And a millimeter towards the left, you will get into the neurovascular bundle. Because we've got 10 times magnification, I can see exactly where I go. In fact, it's very difficult to make a mistake when you're doing robotic surgery because of such good vision. So there you see there's very tenuous nerves, the non-myelinated nerves that, that carry uh, impulses to the penis for erectile function and, and also to the... Uh, sphincter area, so on. So if we are in this clear plane, it doesn't bleed at all. And we can exactly find a plane between the prostate with the capsule of the prostate intact on the prostate and separated from the neurovascular bundle. And because we're able to do this, this single step, I call it the money step for prostatectomy. And this will allow us to preserve a man's potency. So imagine a 50-year-old man having prostate cancer and then we tell him after surgery that he will not be able to have intercourse for the rest of his life. That is not an acceptable proposition in this day and age where we have such good advances. So here you go. The neurovascular bundle is saved and we're separating the prostate from the bundle without injuring the neurovascular bundle, uh, without injuring it at all. So there is. So if you look at it, this area, is the area that carries the nerves. This is what has been saved in this particular step. But when I was studying uh, in Med's medical college when I was doing MCH, we didn't think about this. We would only go and take out the prostate. We would say, the prostate has got cancer, take it out. We didn't think about where the nerves are and so on. So you see these nerves here going up and down like this. It's, it's like, a, like a U-shaped. 
and that is what needs to be preserved if a person needs to be potent after surgery. So in terms of operating room time, in terms of blood loss, in terms of complications, in terms of positive margins, in terms of continence, in terms of potency, erectile function, the robot was significantly better. And this has been proved more than 10 years ago. In 2010, all this data came out. So uh, in the last 10 years, our only goal has been to improve the uptake of robotic surgery. Uh, Though the data is out there that proves significantly that we are in terms of outcomes better, the uptake has not been that much. And what about in specifically in prostate cancer when you compare surgery to other modalities such as radiation? So definitely surgery is better, that's been proven. And prostatectomy, watchful waiting, radiation, hormone therapy, again, surgery comes out on top. Uh, when you when you talk about survival advantages again these are data that can be argued either way depending upon the stage and the grade of tumors of the patient but generally what we found is if they are younger patients 75 and lesser then they perform better with surgery and if they are older patients above 75 then we generally push them towards radiation so age alone is not a criteria You've always seen a good 80-year-old gentleman and a bad 60-year-old gentleman in terms of their physical status and performance. So just don't take age alone. But if we look at the patient, if they could uh, maintain themselves well and they exercise regularly and keep themselves fit, I think surgery, they will do very well when they have prostate cancer, provided it's localized. So the point here is the bar is being continuously raised in prostate cancer surgery. Every step, every year, we've slowly chipped away at what was the negativity surrounding prostate cancer surgery in terms of continence and potency. And now we're able to confidently tell patients that more than 99% of the times they will not have any uh, difficulty with continence. And depending upon their pre-operative sexual function, they will also have a good sexual outcome. So what about renal surgery? Is it only prostate surgery that uh, we're using robots? Renal surgery, again, we use it for nephrectomy, partial nephrectomy, pyeloplasty, and, and again, urethral transposition, reimplantation, and uh, renal transplants as well, we are using it. So typical example of a PUJ obstruction. Again, these surgeries are, uh, perfectly done with the robot. Patients need to stay inside the hospital only for 24 hours. So imagine coming for a pyeloplasty and staying inside the hospital for 24 hours and going home. So the morning they come get admitted, next day morning they're out of the hospital. So uh, less than 24 hours stay has been attempted as well. But in our, in our country, there's no incentive to send them home quickly. What is important is it is possible that we can do this within 24 hours and take, take them. So what you see here is the pelvis, which is dilated, and the space in between is, this is the area that is obstructed. So all we need to do is cut out the obstructed area. You see the stent inside, and then do a spatulation and re this. So typical small thing that can be done within 30 to 45 minutes with the robot. And you don't need to put a big incision because the kidney is way back up here under the rib cage. You necessarily have to do a rib resection and get into that area to do this pyeloplasty. But with the robot, all that can be avoided 24 hours in the hospital and they move out very quickly. So again, uh, access advantages. And because we're suturing so easily with the robot, it, it beats laparoscopy in terms of how effective it is uh, for this anastomosis to happen. So I'll quickly go on and push you, push this video towards the end so that you see how the end result is. So you see a suturing. So the suturing again is one of the key advantages. So purely ablative surgery, you may not have great advantages, but when there is a reconstructive element in robotic surgery or any surgery for that matter, the robot easily scores over other modalities of uh, treatment. So for instance, when you do a nephrectomy, and uh, it's an ablative surgery, you're taking out the kidney. But if there is a damage to the renal vein or the junction between the renal vein and the IVC or something like that, 
you will wish that you had the robot and its suturing ability to quickly control the bleeding. So that is one of the key advantages. When things go well, then people say, I can, I can do this with laparoscopy. I may not need a robot. But when there is trouble, you necessarily need the advantages of the robot to uh, control the uh, negative fallout. So what about partial nephrectomy? This is, an, again, a point that's important. Now, previously, for kidney tumors, everybody was removing the entire kidney. But this is no longer acceptable. Smaller tumors, T1, A, T1, B tumors, you only need to do a partial nephrectomy. You can only cut out the tumor and save the rest of the kidney with the same oncological outcomes as radical nephrectomy. So it's not like because we are doing a partial nephrectomy, the oncological outcomes are compromised. The oncological outcomes are similar for radical nephrectomy and partial nephrectomy. And that's the reason why we have to preserve as much nephrons as possible. So, and we've got the technology at hand to do this. I'll give you an example. So this is a patient that has got a tumor that is not seen outside. It is an endophytic tumor, right? So if, and if, you, if I quickly go back to this area, and if you see this, it's a totally endophytic tumor. If you see the kidney on the surface, you will not be able to see this tumor. But if you, if when you're operating with robotic surgery, one of the advantages that we have is we have an intraoperative ultrasound. The robot has the ability to be uh, co-opted with an intraoperative ultrasound. So here you see, this is the renal artery and vein, and this is us putting the ultrasound on top of the patient. So this is a robotic drop-in ultrasound probe that shows us exactly where the tumor is. I know where the tumor is. I know how lateral I need to go to cut. And I need. I also know the depth of the tumor. So we can keep the probe on top of the tumor while we cut out the tumor. So if you'll see this example of us doing this procedure. And there you see, we're cutting out the tumor deep inside and closing back the tumor, uh, the, the renal bed as well. So... One of the key advantages here is our ability to preserve renal function. So all of us would not bat an eyelid if the patient had two kidneys and one kidney uh, we are removing, the other kidney is there, he can live 100 years with one kidney. But what if the gentleman had uh, only a single kidney? You know, I see a lot of patients now that have had nephrectomy for a tumor, for VHL or something like that, where they could have done a partial nephrectomy. And now necessarily we do a partial nephrectomy because they have a single kidney status. I think that's one of the key advantages. Nephron sparing for smaller renal tumors is mandatory. Obviously, if there's a big tumor in the kidney, you know, 10 centimeters, 12 centimeters, then you cannot save that kidney. If it's a small kidney, then we should give a potential for uh, saving the kidney as much as possible. This is us closing back the kidney. And that's a bolster that's been used. And when we come out, we put the gerator fascia on top of the kidney. It look like we've never gone inside and come out. So again, only about 10% of the, so you see this closing with gerator fascia. And if you do a CT scan in about six months time, you will not see the defect at all. Okay? So um, again, major advantage, nephron sparing. So this is one of the points. It's a dedicated robotic ultrasound system. And it also helps us in prostate surgery. And the way it helps us is it gives us another fourth dimension. I see in 3D when I'm operating, but there's also a fourth dimension that tells us how deep I need to go. Suppose I'm very close to the rectum. I can put the ultrasound in the rectum and then see how much depth I need to go into. That's one of the advantages as well. So there you go. Advantages are... Blood loss, pain levels, faster recovery, shorter stay, smaller incision, lower complications, and better functional and oncological outcome. There's no denying that. And ergonomics are also good. Surgeon sits and operates. In a laparoscope, I need to stand and operate for several hours, but here I can sit and operate. Again, a key advantage. And it's taken the world by storm. America has got about 5,000 robots. Europe has got an equally big number. and and in India, there's only 75 robots. America has got 5,000 robots for 330 million people. India, we've got 75 robots for 1.3 crore people. So that's 130, uh, um, uh, you know, um, that incomparable number. So we need to really 
have more robots in incredible India, right? So again, we are, we are in the late majority. We're slowly going towards being a laggard in adoption of this new technology. But recently, I just heard uh, yesterday from insurance companies that from October 2020, all robotic surgeries are going to be uh, covered under insurance. So that's a good thing that's coming our way. And slowly, I think it will make a major difference in the number of people who can access this technology. So uh, but the important point is there is a learning curve to this. It's not like if you have a robot, you can just go ahead and perform surgery. There is a definite learning curve. Any complex procedure will have a learning curve and you have to breach the learning curve before you go ahead and perform surgery for patients. That's very important to uh, know. So I'm going to quickly go on and, and uh, talk about the cost issue in robotics. I recent, I told you that insurance companies from October 2020 uh, have generally agreed to accept robotic surgery as well. But affordability is a key question um, because it costs generally, it will cost one and a half lakhs more than what a conventional open and open surgery can achieve. But with, because we are a high volume center, we managed to bring that cost down to about one lakh more than conventional open surgery. But if we just looked at the cost alone, then we are defeating the purpose. Uh, we are missing the point, primarily because the number of days in the hospital, the number of days they need to be in bed, the number of days their caregiver needs to be looking after them. All that is drastically reduced when you're doing robotic surgery. So if you just look at the cost of a patient, um, you know, cost to the patient by what he spends during uh, the stay in the hospital, then we miss, miss the point. You have to take an overall perspective of how many days missed from work, how many days the caregiver has to be looking after them, and what are the outcomes is far, far superior when you compare it to conventional open surgery. So here we're trying to provide these outcomes at an affordable cost. And the only way we are able to do it is because we're a relatively high volume center. And we want to increase it even more so that we pass on the benefits to the patients. So this is my favorite slide. World population 6.7 billion. And if we do not uh, allow this sort of technology to touch our masses in India, then I think as medical fraternities, uh, we are failing in our duty, primarily because it's a technology that has massive advantages. All it needs is a change in mindset for us to allow this technology to help our masses. So, and it's not only in urology, general surgery, colorectal, hepatobiliary, ENT, and CTBS have slowly started coming into the picture, but predominantly it's being done in urology, but other specialties are also coming into the fray. And newer robots are also coming into the fray. This is the Hugo robot, Medtronic robot that's gonna to come to India next year. And then there's another robot called the CMRS robot. That's again, a British robot that's also come into, the, come into India this year. But, and things are improving massively in this field. So the mindset change needs to be there for us to allow this technology to help our uh, patients. Thank you very much for this opportunity. And uh, it's been a, always a pleasure to talk to IMA members and I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you. Thank you for the enlightening speech, sir. Dr. Uh, Dr. G. Shivaraman has got one question. He's asking, when does total continence return after robotic prostatectomy? Uh, yeah. yeah, Madam Kekra, who's the doctor? Dr. G. Srinivasan, sir. He so, a very know. nice question, Dr. Srinivasan. Uh, there are two or three points that we need to look into when we talk about continence. One is the patient's general habitus whether they're very fat, obese patient. Number two is the cancer load as well. So depending upon the cancer load is how we tailor our surgery to each and every patient. So the cancer load determines how away from the patient I go. So it's, it's like a tailoring a suit. You go into a shop and the suit is measured according to your body habitus, exactly similar. Based on their cancer load, the MRI, the biopsy, we tailor the surgery as well. 
So if, if we need to go wide away and then we need to go closer into the sphincter, then the continence takes a longer time for it to come back. But if it's a relatively lower grade cancer, lower stage cancer, then we go close to the prostate. We've had patients who are continent from day one. So again, it depends on the individual patient, the muscle tone and so on. But generally, I would say up to three months is what you should take. Beyond three months, they would usually 90, more than 95% of the patients come down to at least zero pads by around three months. If they are taking longer for their continence to go into, then we need to look into why they're having that incontinence period. I hope that answered the question. Am I audible? Yes, sir. Uh, any more questions, you can post it in the chat box or you can raise your hands so that we can unmute your uh, uh, audio. Dr. Jamina Rani wants to be unmuted. Rupa, please. Yes, sir. Dhanashekar, can you unmute Dr. Jamina Rani? Yes, madam. Yes, yeah. Sir, it's a small doubt. A small cyst sitting on the hilum near the, um, uh, say, that artery and vein. How will you remove it uh, through uh, this robot, uh, robotic surgery? A very, very nice point, man. I think you've all seen a patient that has uh, uh, such a I've problem. got a patient. I've got a patient really? for so a long time. Uh, Depends on where exactly the cyst is, madam. If it is sitting on the artery and vein, also we can remove it. It's hilum of the kidney. Yeah, it can be done well with robotics so because we see better. So, what we usually would do is we dissect the vein and the artery completely up to the tumor and then lift out the tumor from the artery and vein. Only problem comes when there is an infiltration of the vessels by the tumor. And if that has happened, then it, it's not a, a case that can be managed with. Uh, partial nephrectomy or just uh, removal of the tumor. That's not an acceptable way. If it's just a cyst that's sitting on top of the vessels, it very easily comes out because what you see is us cutting the tumor, cutting the kidney and stitching it back together. And getting the cyst and putting the, in fact, I've got a couple of videos that I can uh, show you if time permits after Dr. Kuman uh, finishes, where we've okay. done exactly the same thing. In fact, I can show it to you now if you've uh, if you would allow me, but I, I don't want to take Dr. Kamanan's time. Let, uh, let him finish talking and maybe I'll show you that video where exact same point you're asking, we could show you where a hyla tumor sitting on the vessels is being removed. Thank you. Thank you. A lot of questions are there to ask you. Let uh, Dr. Kamanan uh, finish his uh, lecture. Okay, man. That, I think that uh, he's been waiting from morning and he might be cross with me. Dr. Kamanan, Dr. Rupa, yes, yeah. I'm very happy to introduce our next speaker of the day, Dr. Kumanan Shanmugam, Consultant General Physician and Diabetologist at Chennai Urology and Robotics Institute Hospital. He has completed his MBBS from St. John's Medical College, Bangalore, following which he completed his MD in Internal Medicine in the UK. He also has done his postgraduate training in General Practice and Family Medicine in Southeast Scotland. He's a well-known doctor based in Chennai who specializes in internal medicine and has been practicing for over 23 years. His field of expertise and interest is in general family medicine and geriatrics. He specializes in diabetes management, allergy treatment, irritable bowel syndrome and insulin-free treatment. Beyond affiliation with many hospitals, professionally, he has been an active member of Royal College of Physicians United Kingdom. He is currently practicing at Chennai Urology and Robotics Institute Hospital and at Chennai One Health Center. We are very happy to welcome Dr. Kumanan Shanmugam. Over to you, sir. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you for that excellent uh, introduction. And, uh, and also, I thank uh, Dr. Anand for the excellent talk on uh, urology and robotics. Uh, can everyone hear me, please? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. We are able to hear you. Okay. And uh, let me share my screen. And uh, 
first of all i would like to uh, thank the urology institute and uh, uh, the indian medical association for giving me this opportunity to do this talk on covid-19 and uh, diabetes the present challenges and recommendations i take this opportunity to uh, uh, give my condolences to all those medical uh, uh, staff doctors who have lost their life in fighting this coronavirus and i also thank the um, frontline healthcare workers and the volunteers we are help, who are helping us to fight this uh, coronavirus uh, coronavirus or the covid-19 is one of the greatest um, pandemic that i think mankind has faced in the recent past it's such enormity and what i see is diabetes is also a slow pandemic so there is interaction of two pandemics which is giving rise to um, such an uh, amount of health uh, emergency across the world so in preparing this talk i've gathered information from my personal experience and practice and also i have looked at some peer reviewed journals uh, especially stephen or bronstein for practical recommendations and uh, for a national indian national strategic framework from dr mohan vishwanath and then an article on what clinicians as clinicians what we need to do from eleni papadoski and uh, i would like to disclose that uh, i don't have any conflict of interest so this this pandemic is really a race uh, at the human level at the body level there is a race against to fight and contain the infection that's the reason i put it as the race so the the moment the body enters the virus enters the our respiratory system uh, it latches on to the uh, the ace2 inhibitors and opens up the cell uh, through the spike protein and immediately there is a proliferation of uh, the virus within our lung tissues if we are able to contain this infection uh, we the the virus replication is stopped but if it doesn't and patient develops symptoms then the growth is exponential so there is a race there between our immune system and the uh, virus at another level we are running to create a vaccine or find a, uh, a cure for this virus at a third level we our economy is going down the drains we need to do something to uh, scaffold it and bring it up so that uh, we can fight this virus at another level uh, we have lost our uh, individual freedom and that is more important uh, because of the lockdown we can't go out we can't do our normal activities so at various levels we are having a race with this virus so little bit about this virus way back in 1930 uh, some people who were having um, respiratory upper respiratory tract infections uh, when they collected this uh, specimens they found few uh, viruses uh, which they could not uh, actually culture so for a long time this was uh, the difficulty then they developed the organ culture and they could in 1964 um, they first cultured this organisms and uh, this viruses and uh, when the electron uh, microscope came into uh, use the this was the first uh, picture taken up uh, uh, of the coronavirus at that time so there was a ring around the virus and so they named it corona which is crown so the picture we are seeing in the middle is the coronavirus electron microscope study done in india and uh, this is the genome complete genome Uh, of the coronavirus containing about 30000 nucleotides uh, the reason why this within few weeks that we had the virus we found out the complete genome and this has helped us to uh, find out how this virus it's, it's a novel virus and it's new to our immune system so if if we had any uh, previous similar infections and our body had immunity some of us are able to cope otherwise it's causing a havoc to our immune system so completely uh, um, deciphering the genome has helped us forward to uh, bring up possible treatment and vaccination so dr v uh, dr lee wen lang is an ophthalmologist who was working in uh, the outpatient department in wuhan and he noted that there was a, 
um, acute respiratory syndrome like uh, the disease uh, pneumonia happening in people related to the wet market in Wuhan. This was way back in second week of December 2019. Then, um, you were, as you were seeing more patients, you were seeing that the, 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 the humans could be a vector, like that could, there could be a transmission between people to people. He, and he warned his colleagues to wear protective, uh, uh, um, uh, do protection, uh, wear masks to protect the, uh, them against the virus. So by 30th of Jan, the WHO, uh, WHO declared it as a public health emergency. And by 11th March, it became a world pandemic. And now we have 20 million of people affected and more than 7 lakh people already uh, have died. So in comparing this virus, I would, uh, I would uh, compare it, would give an analogy with an USB stick. Because you know, as you know, viruses need a, a living cell to divide so and they don't they don't move on move out on themselves so they need a vector so humans they act like vectors like uh, when we sneeze when our body fluids um, spreads in the air like uh, coughing then they each virus acts like an usb stick and and the, and the ports are our mouth and ears they get connected and they start, start multiplying within our body so the symptomatology uh, following an incubation period of two to 14 days, majority of people develop simple uh, upper respiratory tract infections like cough, fever, shortness of breath, and sometimes we can have GA tract infection as well. So fever is most consistent about 98% followed by dry cough, fatigue, sputum production, and the shortness of breath. Um, some people may have short uh, muscle pain, sore throat, headaches, chills, and GI symptoms as well. Then following that, about 10 to 11 days, there is a late phase uh, where they start uh, falling, um, feeling breathlessness and fall in oxygen saturation. The reason why I have marked shortness of breath, that symptom, the shortness of breath or any breathing difficulty is a sign that the lungs are getting overwhelmed. What we see is that even prior to that, people's saturation start falling but they don't, they don't have the symptoms, corresponding symptoms. This we call as happy hypoxia. So that is why we are saying we need to check the people's saturation as part of uh, uh, initial examination so that we can identify the fall in saturation very early and identify those people whose symptoms is going to worsen. So when we, when we advise our patients, we can we can we have we can encourage and empower them to get these small pulse oximeters which they can use at home so the, so that they can identify fall in saturation very early coming to people with diabetes we know that people with diabetes do not show uh, acute uh, symptoms in the beginning so like a normal person they may not have their fever may not be high uh, and uh, they, they they may not uh, show up acute inflammatory symptoms in the beginning, but their deterioration comes very fast. So we need to, even if there is a mild symptom, we need to make sure is it a possibility of coronavirus. Other thing is somebody whose blood sugar has been very under good control and suddenly their blood sugar is uh, shooting up and down, then we need to wonder whether it could be a, a, an infection. And because this is corona time, we need to know whether it could be corona infection. And especially in type 1 diabetics, if there is a deterioration of glycemic control, then they, there's a possibility that they can go into diabetic ketoacidosis fast, and we need to have ways of bringing them into hospital and treating them. So a little bit about uh, the coronavirus and how uh, it reacts with our body. Surprisingly, the two major endocrine uh, um, receptors we have in our body, the ACE2 receptors and the possibly the DPP4 receptors, uh, which causes the incretin effect. These two are involved in this virus. In, when we had uh, uh, coronavirus one, we knew that it affected the ACE receptor. So the coronavirus two also affect the ACE receptors. And when we had the MERS virus, the Mediterranean Respiratory Distress Syndrome virus, it selectively targeted the DPP4 cells. So these coronaviruses are somehow, they are very, very close to human endocrine system so that the, the, their complications are very severe. So 
we'll see a little bit about the cytokine storm because when coronavirus enters the body, it causes uh, infection of the respiratory epithelium, res necrosis, and it leads to pneumonia. And there is impaired uh, neutrophil function, impaired interferon uh, production, gamma production. There is disruption of CD4 cell, uh, eight and four cells function, and there is cytokine storm with the production of uh, interleukins and uh, um, uh, uh, see interleukin one and interleukin six, which causes uh, quite a bit of damage uh, to the lungs. So if we remove the SARS-CoV-2 and put diabetes, we find that diabetes also causes similar problems and causes a low-lying inflammation, which uh, uh, which uh, makes them prone for all these um, path pathophysiology to happen very fast. Uh, and there is also increased expression of H2 in diabetics. And there is a molecule for furin, called furin molecule, which is inside the cell and and uh, which helps uh, actually endocytosis of, uh, process within our cells. And the coronavirus seems to hijack this furin molecule in order to uh, form vesicles and start the process of endocytosis. So in this way, the coronavirus seems to have adapted to the human cell so that it can easily invade and proliferate. The uh, adjutensin converting enzyme 2 is seen in organs like uh, lung, liver, uh, kidneys, heart, and even in pancreas. So there is a uh, there is a hypothesis that these uh, viruses can block these receptors and cause uh, underfunction of pancreatic cells and lead to uh, hyperglycemia. What we see is in people who uh, elderly people, especially who get coronavirus. They, their blood sugar shoots up even uh, in spite of not having diabetes. The, one of the reasons is the cytokine storm, stress-induced hyperglycemia. The other is the possibility that the pancreas is getting affected, their insulin uh, secretion comes down. That makes them uh, for susceptible for secondary bacterial infection and complicating the whole clinical picture. Also, ACE2 in, uh, enzyme assay helps uh, to convert angiotensin 2 uh, to angiotensin 1-7. The angiotensin 1-7 is actually anti-proliferatory. Because its levels is low, the, the angiotensin has sufficient quantity to affect the angiotensin receptors, causing vasoconstriction and pro, uh, a pro-proliferatory state uh, with accumulation of insulin, uh, inflammatory fluid in the lungs, and leading to complications. So when we look at the risk factors, the, the, the study you see on the uh, left is the actually data that we got from, uh, reported from United Kingdom of patients admitted in the hospital with uh, complications. Uh, and on the right side, we see what, what, what are the usual risk factors. Uh, so what we see is, is that uh, age is one of the major factor with uh, with the hazard ratio, any hazard ratio more than one is significant. So uh, the hazard ratio of uh, uh, nearly 13.59, uh, then diabetes, chronic uh, cardiac diseases, chronic renal disease, obesity, and pulmonary disease. So if you see the people at risk as reported by Mohan et al, the age 65 and older, uh, all ages with underlying medical conditions, particularly if not well controlled, diabetes, COPD, serious lung problems, CKD, liver disease, and those who are compromised. Also, I later uh, talk to you about, about a study uh, relating to obesity. Severe obesity is, is a major risk factor. Now, another thing is living in a nursing home or long-term care facility. So these are some of the data coming from India. Confirmed cases have gone uh, about, um, about 2 million people, and uh, uh, most of them have recovered. And we have uh, a death of uh, uh, mortality of about 42,000 people. So if we take uh, uh, by statewide, Maharashtra and uh, um, Bombay accounts for majority of deaths in, uh, uh, in India. And in Tamil Nadu, those who are above 60 have uh, major uh, uh, about 70 70 to 70% 70, uh, of uh, the deaths are in people with either diabetes or hypertension. 
So, um, so what, what is the interaction between the personal health and society? So this is where uh, how the society is uh, tuned to face a pandemic comes into uh, force and the interaction of the individual and the society uh, creates a, a platform for how the pandemic is going to proceed. So personally, we have our lifestyle. What is our general lifestyle, our diet? Uh, is that leading to a chronic inflammation state and how how uh, uh, how the aging population is and genome for example some be, uh, more nearly 40 percent of people who are getting the infection with coronavirus if we do the um, antibody test in the initial period where they don't any have any symptoms and in spite of having the virus they don't have antibodies but there is some genomic ability say there, there's a lot of theories like a, a previous vaccinations with bcg and all those things but we know that the genome some genomes are primed and they're able to cope with the infection whereas others succumb to it so the genome plays a very important role and in the society as, as the infrastructure is the health related infrastructure how the government is pro processed to face the pandemic their policy what what is important for them because we have so many uh, uh, class differences, so many economic variations. We have the richest people in the world and the poorest people in the world. What is the priority for the government? How is the culture and customs uh, uh, influencing? For example, in Italy, when there was lockdown, people got together alone uh, and families and parties. That's how, that was their culture, like how, being on holiday is going to the beach or going to the party. And we cannot uh, uh, call up for strict um, uh, social distancing, like how we do it here. So the cases went up. The, uh, the the the, uh, the the mortality rate went up so th there is an interaction between the society and the individual so the reason why i put up this slide is for future people who who are going to be at the level of controlling quality or health, forming health related infrastructure we should keep this mind to to cope with any any pandemics in the future so what i see is diabetic itself is a slow pandemic we already have 1 million people dying every year due to diabetes or diabetes related problems. It's because we are, not, we are not identifying it. We need a corona to come and show, okay, this is what is the red threat in diabetes. If you take 75 million, 75 million people are affected with uh, diabetes and every year 1 million people are uh, dying, is this, not a, a, is this not a pandemic? We are having a pandemic, but we are not recognized. If you say 12% of the world population uh, in in, uh, in lower and middle socioeconomic countries, 12% uh, of the population is with uh, um, diabetes. So the death rate in, in diabetes is most common in vulnerable people, elderly people, 60 to 69 and 70 to 69. So the WHO, is, uh, the World Heart uh, Association is saying, uh, by 2035, that we will not 9 million, which is 77 million at the moment. So what are the precautions that we need to take? Apart from the general precautions for, or the universal precautions that we are advising, like hand washing, social distancing, wearing a mask, avoiding gathering, the special precautions for people with diabetes. And that is to a person with diabetes, anytime any emergency can happen, they can be high sugar, low sugar. So they need to have relevant contact details with them. Pay extra attention to one's glucose control. Uh, later I'll show you a study about uh, how often people do study. But uh, what we need to, we need to empower people to do blood glucose uh, monitoring very often. Uh, especially when the time that they can't access a, a healthcare professional. And in case of any flu-like symptoms, like say mild temperature, cough, difficulty in breathing, it's important for them to immediately call up and consult with their doctor. Most of it, what happens, there is denial. They don't deny, it's a, it's a common cold, I'm having a slight fever. And uh, they try to uh, brush it under the carpet. They don't want to talk about it. There is a bit of social stigma attached to having a, a te even testing for corona. So we need to encourage them that if there is a possibility, it could be corona. So there should be official, sufficient regular intake of water, maintain their hydration, adequate diabetes medicines, and make sure they have enough food. Make sure they'll be able to act if the glucose drops suddenly, like we discussed sick rule day, uh, what happens if they become sick, 
how much uh, so we have prepare a plan with our we have a plan with the patient so ensure good nutrition by eating varied and balanced diet recommend food that are those with low glycemic index avoid excessive uh, consumption of fried uh, foods limit consumption of food high in sugar and carbohydrates and fats so already we know having diabetes makes people prone for infection especially higher rates in joint infection sepsis and cellulitis so hyperglycemia itself causes a dysfunction of the immune system hba1c 9% has increased risk for 60% increased risk for hospitalization so when we had corona virus 1 in 2002 we had a lesson we knew this virus is going to cause uh, affect the ace2 receptors and those people at that time had uh, hyperglycemia and those individuals who had hyperglycemia had mortality rate was high so in 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 mers in 2012 uh, the odds ratio that is a, uh, was 7.2 uh, one is significant so they 7.2 to 15.7 for nearly 35 to 40% of those with diabetes uh, uh, died um, uh, because of the uh, uh, mers 2 and even in influenza uh, people with uh, um, diabetes there was triple risk with hospitalization and uh, and the chance of uh, them getting admitted into intensive care was four times so what's the effect of diabetes in covid 19 20 to 50% of severe outcome happening with uh, including icu admission and deaths are related to diabetes and uh, and its comorbidities uh, like uh, uh, obesity and uh, uh, um, upper age group is uh, contributing to this factor there is poor viral clearance there is impaired neutrophil uh, function there is increased ace2 expression like i said before and then there is increased uh, a, a incretin uh, seen in diabetes which are the membrane brown proteins involved in entry of coronavirus to the cell there is impaired t cell function and in, in, in fact impaired increased interleukin 6 which is uh, damaging to the uh, cells um what we see is covid-19 attacking the ace2 receptors in the pancreatic cells may be causing hyperglycemia even in people with previous without previous history of diabetes and uh, these are some of the studies that i have gone through in the what i would like to see is the retrospective study in uk which had about uh, uh, like uh, uh, the heart hazard ratio of 1.5 and that went up to more than 2.36 in people with uh, a higher hpa1c and also in china uh, which is a large study um, diabetes and patients and diabetes without uh, uh, without uh, diabetes with corona had a 7.3% more mortality rate or risk uh, compared to people with corona, people without diabetes so this is an interesting study uh, corona data study done in uh, france uh this was mainly in uh, diabetic patients with high uh, uncontrolled uh, blood sugar with hba1c um, more than uh, 65 or 8.1 percent what they found is one consistent factor which was causing um uh, the uh, uh, prognosis becoming severe and uh, the death rate at the end of 7 days uh, higher is obesity so if we have a patient who is a diabetic who has uncontrolled blood sugar and who is uh, and who is obese we need to uh, uh, just make sure that this person is monitored and his blood sugar levels are controlled and there's another study in um, in in uh, china which showed that good blood sugar control uh, the survival rate is 98% whereas hba1c below 10 there is a chance of 11% risk of death so what is it that is between corona and diabetes so studies have shown that diabetes are at the, uh, diabetics are at the same level of risk of contracting the infection as a non diabetic as long as they follow the universal uh, precautions but diabetes by itself we need to know that it's an uncontrolled proliferative state with impaired immunity there is upregulation of ways and furin uh, protein Uh, leading to proliferation of the coronavirus with increased viral loading following the infection the hyperglycemia and related fluid depletion leads to vasoconstriction and circulatory compromise leading to a hyperosmolar state and propensity to pulmonary embolism stroke renal failure and bacterial pneumonia 
So coronavirus leads to cytokine storm with uh, high levels of tissue necrosis factor alpha and uh, interleukin-1 and interleukin-6 leading to lung damage. This also leads to hyperglycemia that is impaired T cell function and impaired interferon gamma production. Uh, the elevated inflammatory fluids in the lungs leads to alveolar edema and failure of oxygenation. There is leukopenia and thrombocytopenia and high levels of ferritin leading to thromboembolism, ARDS, respiratory failure and assisted ventilation. So if you see diabetes complication and comorbidities, you see association of obesity, inflammation, coagulation, uh, uh, thrombophilic state, hyperglycemia, old age, hypertension and renal disease. And if you take corona, the SARS-2 virus causes beta cell damage, causing hyperglycemia and causes cytokine storm, uh, worsening of uh, new on, the worsening of metabolic disease or also causing new onset diabetes. So it's a double pandemic that we are seeing. So treatment wise, there is an international consensus and this is a national, the one on the left is the national strategic uh, framework uh, uh, advised by Mohan et al. Both are same almost. Um, uh, we need to keep the uh, fasting plasma glucose less than 110 D, 20 and uh, postprandial less than 180, HbA1c uh, less than 7%. The treatment uh, recommendations are DPP-4 inhibitors are generally well tolerated and can be continued. We need to uh, look up, uh, um, think about metformin because in a dehydrated state, it can cause lactic acidosis and, and also cause the renal compromise. The SGLT inhibitors have been re recently coming in, uh, coming into use largely by um, diabet diabetologists and also cardiologists, and they have uh, uh, they have risk of dehydration and diabetic ketoacidosis. So patients should stop taking them if it, uh, they are admitted to hospital. GLP receptors once again can cause dehydration. Uh, if they are insulin therapy, they should continue it. The, the main thing is regular monitoring of blood glucose. They need more frequent close monitoring and adjustment of insulin uh, on, based on blood glucose follicles, uh, blood glucose values. Um, and also they should have a, a check blood glucose and urinary ketones uh, if they are type 1 diabetic for uh, hyperglycemia and ketoacidosis. The international consensus, they, all, they talk about the same thing, but they talk about uh, what, uh, one factor called uh, time in range, which is uh, how much of time in a day that the patient's uh, blood sugar controls are within normal range between 3.9 to 10. Uh, we don't have, uh, uh, we have very few patients on uh, type 2 diabetics with on continuous glucose monitoring, uh, whereas uh, type 1 diabetics are, and we can do flash glucose monitoring and see if their they values are uh, within this range. Uh, more than 70 percent. This is coming into more use, the time in range, as we note that the HP1C can be inconsistent in elderly people when they have some, uh, uh, due to senescence of the RBCs in elderly people, uh, their HP1C values can be low. But using the TIR, which can, where they're, they're developing a protocol, we can do flash glucose monitoring or CGM so that this is kept under range to prevent any complications of diabetes. In patients who are needing hospitalized, we need to look for any comorbidity. If there's one or two comorbidities, the risk is high. So we need to have low threshold to bring them to ICU. High CRP, elevated EGFR, HPA1C more than 7.5%. Uh, 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 7 hyperglycemia, abnormal blood gas analysis, elevated troponin, uh, and uh, any involvement of cardiac or uh, possibility of uh, elevated D dimer, they need to be uh, going to ICU. Uh, we need to stop all oral hypoglycemic and switch to insulin and uh, do continuous monitoring of their glucose. If they are on already on ACP NIRTOS or ERBs, we have to continue them, but we have to check whether their cardiac functions are within normal range. So glycemic control, uh, we need to keep the blood sugar within 70 to 180. If there is more than 180, the mortality rate is high. And uh, patients with well-controlled diabetes uh, had lower inflammatory markers. A retrospective study of patients in US showed that people with hyperglycemia had a longer stay and a subset of people with high blood sugar, even without diabetes, had sevenfold greater of uh, mortality. So glycemic control is important. Asymptomatic infections, we can, uh, asymptomatic infection with home care, 
uh, symptomatic patients, hospital care, usual therapy, whether plus or minus uh, SGLT2, ICU care, frequent insulin uh, monitoring and uh, dose of insulin or IV insulin. We need to look, look at the comorbidities and prevent any compl complications. Uh, in prevention, people with diabetes, we know are a vulnerable group. We have to adapt. Uh, we have to create adaptive strategies in health services. We have to build up our capacity for emergency preparedness. So some drugs like DPP-4 inhibitors are can be used, but they can be have an interaction with lopinavir. Uh, SGLT2, as I said, there's uh, risk of uh, dehydration, electrolyte imbalance. Same with the GLP receptor. Sulfonary ureas can risk of hypoglycemia. Uh, so, and they also interact with lopinavir and hydroxychloroquine. Pioglitazone is an anti inflammatory. Once again, it can cause fluid retention and it can interact with pavipravir. Insulin in, is recommended in critically ill patients. Of course, there is a risk of hypoglycemia and we need to check, uh, we need to monitor their hydration and uh, maintain their uh, blood sugar. They can also interact with hydroxychloroquine because hydroxychloroquine by itself can lower blood sugar. So what are the challenges? There is limited access to healthcare. There is a face-to-face -face consultation is lacking. There is poor glycemic control, access to medicine, lack of income. People are not able to work. They're low in, they are not able to buy medicines. There is fear of illness, uncertainty. And in our country, there is limited resource of video or online consultation. There is inability to use smartphone technology so that we cannot uh, real time interact with the patients. Lack of integrated national registry for to connect people with the existing services. Lack, lack of psychological support, though it is coming up more, uh, because people are uh, uncertainty causes anxiety, and that makes their blood sugar uh, gay, uh, go up and down, and that contributes to uh, morbidity and mortality. Lack of robust evidence-based practice for native and Ayurvedic medicines. Government is supporting some medical uh, Ayurvedic, though they may be effective. There is no any uh, studies uh, showing them, and. Um, and there is also a lot of uh, evidence-based medicine to be practiced in this world. So how to help our manage diabetes? I'll quickly run through this. We need to replace active follow. Patients are not able to come, but we have a record of patients who are diabetic, who are obese, or blood sugars are fluctuating. We call them and say, we check on them, how their blood sugars are. We find some ways for them to do blood sugars and report back to us. Or establish uh, vibrant centers in the, locally in the hospitals or mosques. Active outpatients and clinic. We can use Corona surveillance team to visit home and focus on elderly people with comorbidities and diabetes. Recommend self-monitoring of blood glucose by uh, providing uh, monitor uh, glucose monitors. Utilize text messages. Provide guidance for physicians how to manage uh, clinically patients. Uh, allocate individual telephone numbers in the hospital for people so the diabetics in the emergency can call. Send an electro educational video by smartphone. Understanding and emotional responses to pandemic is uh, very important. Establish standards of care, uh, bringing back some order to routine in the times of opportunity, managing stress, leisure, parenting, and relationships. So in terms of about uh, standards of guidelines, there is uh, uh, a few things like uh, where we need to have face-to-face -face consultation. If there's a new type 1 diabetes, we need to see the patient. Or if HbA1c is more than 10% ketone detected, we need to teach them to do blood glucose. They may need IV fluid. We may need to bring them into the hospital. And we need these services have to continue. Uh, we may have forfeit some... Uh, um, consultations regarding eye screening um, or uh, or uh, food services, depending on what the patient's needs are. Uh, pregnancy uh, services need to continue. All consultations can be uh, done through uh, 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 tele telecare should be followed. Face-to-face uh, -face only in regards to uh, urgent uh, consultations. P P patients can uh, 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 empowered to be, uh, do self monitoring so they can they can check their blood sugars at home and report to the doctor. What you see in the lower side is the is a chart showing uh, uh, diabetic patients who were called up during COVID time to see if they are checking their blood sugars regularly. It was noted that only uh, uh, 25 to 30 percent were actually doing. Um, and uh, if we see a new patient, we need to encourage them to do blood sugars. Uh, and uh, we need to teach them uh, the importance of home blood sugar monitoring. 
these are the vaccine in place. Uh, uh, there are nearly about 40 to 50 vaccine on the anvil. Covaxin is a is phase two trial, and uh, we have another vaccine, Zyco D, uh, in phase two and uh, uh, phase two, phase one and phase two travel based on uh, measles virus. And uh, hopefully by two, before the end of this year, we should have a vaccine to help control the infection. So as a take home message, I need to, uh, I would like to run few problems. Coronavirus is a diabetogenic virus with propensity to cause hyper hyperglycemia. So we need to actually screen for diabetes in our patients. Uncontrolled diabetes with obesity poses about 50% risk of adverse outcome. Diabetes is a slow, deadly pandemic that is prevalent in our society. We need to educate our patients for self-care. In future consultations, we need to talk about home sugar, blood sugar monitoring and record keeping. Integrating corona surveillance with blood sugar monitoring of vulnerable patients is a possible uh, a route. We need to talk to the local public health care team and involve them. Encouraging blood sugar monitoring, sharing with us pro so that we can prompt, uh, promptly inter uh, inter uh, intervene. Promote diet and exercise along with the universal corona precautions uh, like social distancing, hand washing and mask. Remember the values, 70 to 120 fasting and 70 to 180 random. If values exceed this, we need to take action. Ex uh, encourage home oxygen monitoring with pulse oximetry and any value less than 94 to 100, take action. Encourage hydration and physical activity. Focus on psychological well-being with web-based psychological intervention, which is becoming available. Elderly who stay alone need help to uh, build up social support with family, friends, and local groups. So, I talked about so much of Corona and I would like to finish in a positive note. With the advent of Corona, with the, with the lockdown, our environment has uh, improved. Uh, you, what you see is the smog in Delhi and Bombay and what you see is uh, the clarity uh, uh, shows how much it has helped the uh, environment. And what you see is the Ganges flowing pure after May, May, millennia. And uh, that's the uh, end of my talk. And what you see on the right side is a picture of Corona drawn by my uh, nephew. It looks very perplexed, and I think it has worked perplexed because of the coronavirus. And uh, uh, if there is any questions, please come forward. Thank, Thank you. you sir. It was a very, very wonderful presentation in detail. Uh, we have one question from Dr. Mohana Das. He's asking about the role of uh, BCG and MMR in prevention of COVID-19, sir. Yeah, what, what happens is, the, because we had this in the national program, BCG has given a baseline of immunity against many infections. So that's, as I talked to you about uh, uh, in the genome, uh, the ability to combat, uh, prevent infection. So these infections baseline has, uh, is giving a protection to people. That's why people abroad are now starting experimenting, giving BCG uh, vaccine in the time of Corona to see if it is causing any problem. Okay. One more question was about the when vaccine would be ready. So I think you put a slide on that. Yeah, so the, it's now in phase two trial. And then there's another trial, uh, 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 so it should be by end of this year, we should have co-vaccine in our country. Dr. Rupa, you can unmute everyone now. They will ask questions. Yeah, I think we should unmute everyone, madam. Um, hello, I'm, uh, it's, uh, uh, can I answer a couple of questions? Um, one, uh, one doctor, uh, Marian, has asked us uh, whether free PSA or total PSA should be done. I think the answer to that question is uh, total PSA is the best one to be done. And uh, it is not only one single value of PSA that is important, but if it shows a trend, that is what you should take. The value of free PSA comes when the PSA is between 4 and 10. And in that case, then there is a situation where you look at the free PSA and if it is less than 15%, then there's a chance of it, uh, the patient harboring malignancy. But more importantly, if a patient has come to us with high PSA, the next step for the patient is multi-parametric MRI of the prostate. Now it has to be done in a good center and in a center that gives a value called pirate value. 
So pyrids value is like, for instance, breast, they give pyrids value. For prostate, it's pyrids value. A pyrids value from one to five is given. And one and two, we can wait and watch. Three, four, and five, we need to do biopsies for the patient. And the reason we are doing MRI is not only to get the pyrids value, but also it tells us where to take the biopsy from. Previously, we were doing transrectal biopsies of the prostate. Now we are doing transperineal biopsy of the prostate. Transrectal biopsy has the potential to introduce infection because we are going through the rectum and needle goes into the prostate and there's a chance of urosepsis and significant gram-negative urosepsis can happen. But in transperineal biopsy, there is zero chance of urosepsis and the patients again go home as a outpatient local anesthetic. This type of biopsy is called MRI cognitive biopsy, which means we look at the MRI and then target the lesion based on the MRI. There is no more blind biopsy by just doing an ultrasound and taking biopsies. So PSA directly to biopsy is not acceptable. PSA, there is one step in between. It's called multi-parametric MRI of the prostate and only then can we do a biopsy of the prostate. Um, again, there's another question. Uh, uh, are we operating at this time of the pandemic? Again, we take full precautions. All of the patients that we operate will have an RT-PCR COVID test done, which shows negative. And if you are in doubt, we still do a CT screening and then take the patients for surgery. Obviously, if they come uh, in an emergency situation for an acute appendix or renal stones with urosepsis, we do not deny surgery. We take them directly with full PPE kit for the surgeons. So surgery is still being done every day in Curie Hospital in this pandemic situation. So. Now, I've got one more uh, point that Dr. Yamunarani wanted to know about uh, this uh, tumor at the hilum of the kidney. So this is an example of a tumor where you see the tumor very close to the renal, uh, one of the refrans of the renal artery. Again, this is something that we can very well do with robotic surgery. If you see this particular picture, you see where the tumor and you see the ureter going close to the tumor as well. So this tumor also can be done with the robotic surgery. I'll go to the, our typical relevant points. Here again, you are uh, 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 looking at the renal vein and the artery. And I'll slowly go to the point where we dissect the tumor from the uh, bed of the renal vessels. There you go. So again, ultrasound is being done to see where the tumor is. And not only where the tumor is, you asked a specific point about where the renal vessels are. Right? So that, again, this ultrasound, we've got color Doppler during this ultrasound. And you'll see this area that we know exactly where the renal vessels is before we cut out the tumor. So here you see, again, renal tumor here. Renal tumor is here and it's sitting right on top of the renal artery. Hmm? So this step, we can slowly cut out the renal tumor and take out the tumor without damaging the vessels. So renal hilar tumor is very eminently possible with this. Again, we're cutting out the tumor here. I've just quickly forwarded it for you. So if you look at this, we're quickly cutting out the tumor. And it is very close to renal vessels. We can't help that. A lot of tumors that we see nowadays are close to the renal vessels. But the advantage is because we see better, we can come from above to the vessels or from the vessels to the tumor. It allows us to take it out in a position that's easy, where we don't damage the renal vessels. So again, here you see this part. It means without affecting the kidney. Yeah, without affecting the kidney. So you see this, these are the main renal vessels going here. The renal vein is here, renal artery is here, and we're cutting it out of that hilar region exactly. And here you see the renal sinus fat. So the sinus fat un under that is the main renal vessels. And what we can do is potentially only cut the two vessels that go into the tumor. Here you see a small branch that is going into the tumor. And this will be potentially cut while we're doing robotic surgery. And then take out the tumor completely without damaging the vessels. So if we damage this vessel here, then the blood supply to the kidney is gone. But because we are away from that, we can see exactly where we are and then we stay away from that vessel and take out. So here you see a small branch getting into the tumor. Now that can be compromised. The, those two branches we can cut and take out without uh, blood supply compromise the rest of the kidney. 
Okay. So it's very important that we have a good arteriogram before we start getting this out. So a lot of times we get CT scans that just show uh, kidney and then the tumor. So that's not enough. CT scans nowadays should show us if we're considering partial nephrectomy, the arteriogram, arterial supply to the kidney and how the tumor is, what sort of arterial supply the tumor gets. And only then we can go ahead and take out uh, uh, this this tumor. So again, let me show you. So see the small vessel here going into the kidney, mm -hmm. going into the tumor, that part of the tumor that we can uh, cut and compromise because we know it is going into the tumor and we won't have trouble if we cut it because it's so you see this clip being put here. I quickly forwarded to that. Yes. Yeah. So there you see yes. the clip being put here and then we can cut only the vessel that goes to the tumor and preserve the rest of the vessels that come into the kidney. I'll show you another example of this, similar. So again, similar picture, madam. Can you see this vessel again? This tumor is very close to the hilar. Yes. Yeah. So this again can be very, very well done. So you see three major vessels going into the kidney. And this again can be done without getting into trouble. I'll quickly show you areas. So this is again, main renal artery that is here, main renal vein that is coming mm -hmm. below that renal artery and this is the tumor, okay. the hilar tumor. So this can be, I'll quickly for want of time, I'll show you only bits of it. Okay. So you see this yeah. cutting? At the base of the tumor, you have some small vessels that you cannot, so uh, the advantage of doing robotics with pneumoperitoneum is you allow a little bit of bleeding to happen and so you see where the vessels are so you can cut it out. So when we, I'll show you once we see this area, you'll realize how well it can be controlled. So at the end of it, you can control it very well, cutting out the tumor, but still hilar tumors can very well be done with robotic surgery. So another example is, I'm sorry, this particular case. If you look at it, look at the size of the tumor and how close it is to the um, vessels. So again, this tumor can also be done. I won't show you the full video, I'll just show you the parts after we cut out the tumor. So this is how it looks like when we cut out the tumor. So the entire half of the kidney has come out because it was a seven centimeter tumor at the lower pole. And then we can uh, suture it back together. I'll show you another example of a video which is even more difficult. So, so if, you, if you look at this particular tumor, this is again something what you asked for, isn't it, madam? Yes, hilum, yes. renal vessels, and it is close to the hilum. Hmm? Even yes. this tumor can be done with robotic surgery. So, you, so it, it is just standing on top of the vessels, and we can cut this tumor out without getting into trouble. So I'll again show you bits of the video where, where we are very close to the vessel. So you can you, the vessels as well as the kidney, isn't it? Yes, ma'am. One second, sorry. If you see this video, I'll show you the bits where, yeah. So this part of it, here is the main renal vein. Can you see that? So when you're doing robotics, uh, laparoscopic surgery, with pneumoperitoneum, we'll see a small gentle pulsation of the vein. The artery itself is usually pulsating like an artery, but the vein is more like a wave pattern you will see. So this is very close to the renal vein. You're separating the renal vein, renal artery, clamping the artery, warm ischemia time should be less than 30 minutes. And then you clamp the artery, see where the vessels are with the help of the ultrasound, and then slowly cut out the tumor. Again, it, it, it is a long video, about eight, 10 minutes, but I don't want to show you the entire video. I'll show you the bits where we cut out the tumor from inside, right? One okay. thing. So there you see, so this is us cutting. So this stage, you see small vessels coming from the main renal vein and main renal artery into the tumor. So this part of it here. So those vessels alone you can cut and the rest of the vessels you preserve. So more than half the kidney you'll be able to save and the tumor alone you can take out. So only the vessels that go into the tumor need to be compromised and the rest of it can be saved. So the days where we take out the entire kidney for renal tumors are numbered. Now, even for bigger tumors, seven, eight centimeter tumors, provided they are accessible, provided the patient warrants nephron sparing surgery, we can potentially take out. So here you see us compromising only the vessel that goes to the tumor. This is the tumor. The rest of the kidney is here. This is the renal vein here. 
So we are cutting out only the vessels that go there and taking out the tumor, uh, not damaging the rest of the kidney. Right? So, so we have one more question uh, from Dr. Mohanadas. How superior is robotic surgery compared with helium laser with respect to BPH? Yeah, very nice question. So holmium laser. So we use holmium laser for uh, laser BPH. Now there are two ways of uh, doing this, sir. One is if it is a big tumor, we can do laser, sir, laser prostatectomy and then uh, enucleate uh, tumor. It's called laser enucleation of the, pro of the prostate. Now laser prostatectomy can be done for big tumors around uh, 200, 300. But robotic surgery also can be done for uh, this prostatectomy. Uh, usually, I prefer to do if it is a bigger tumor, if it cannot be managed with TURP, my general preference is to do a robotic prostatectomy because again, it's a 24-hour hospital stay, patients go home uh, very quickly and uh, without any continuous bladder irrigation or something. And the chances of incontinence when you do robotic surgery for benign prostatic hypertrophy are minimal to next to nil. So, the outcomes are more than similar to laser prostatectomy and TURP, but you can tackle much bigger glands. Like if the highest we've done is 272 gram prostate. It's a pretty big prostate that a patient had. And we do what is called a Millen's prostatectomy. That is, capsule of the prostate is cut and uh, extended up to the bladder neck modification of Millen's prostatectomy. And we completely enucleate the prostatic adenoma and take it out and research the prostate back together. Tiny incisions, 24 to 36 hour hospital stay, patient is home the next day. So uh, rather than talk about which is superior, it needs to be tailored to individual patient's needs. Some people may not be candidates for robotic surgery. Some people may not be candidates for laser surgery. So each and every thing has to be tailored to the patient's needs. Thank you for that question, sir. He also wants to know the cost of the surgery, sir. So for robotic surgery, it will cost for radical prostatectomy anywhere between 3 lakhs to 3.5 lakhs it will happen. Sir. For prostate cancer surgery, this is how uh, it's the usual protocol. Again, for kidney tumor as well, it will be 3 lakhs uh, and up to 3.5 lakhs it will happen. So luckily, insurance companies are covering most of it except the robotic cost. If they don't cover the robotic cost, robotic cost alone will be anywhere between 1 to 1.5 lakhs. If you take out this cost from the equation, that is the true cost of uh, the surgery. If you cover it, the, currently what happens is insurance companies don't cover the robotic cost. So the patients shell out only the robotic cost uh, of the surgery. The rest of it, the insurance companies cover usually without problem. And urethroseal and vesicuretric junction with, uh, yeah, urethroseal, we, we don't need, urethroseals don't need uh, um, robotic surgery. You can do it endoscopically without trouble. But when they have a stricture or when they have reflux, then you can do robotic surgery and do a reimplantation for the patients. That is done very well without trouble. That is a very, very nice indication to do robotic surgery. Uh, there was a question for me for the idea, the antiviral that is effective. Uh, one second. I'll stop my and we'll go back. Yeah, the question was on uh, the. So there was a question for me. Antiviral. Yeah. So the, we haven't found the ideal antiviral yet, but if you see this slide, can you all see the slide? Uh, there's a RNA dependent RNA polymerized enzyme inhibitors like remdesivir and favipravir have found to be effective in uh, mild to moderate. But when it comes to a severe uh, uh, corona induced uh, um, respiratory distress or um, uh, respiratory failure, it's individualization of treatment. In some people, it is ARDS. In some people, it is pulmonary embolism. In some people, it is due to cytokine storm. So depending on that, we use uh, 
uh, either uh, topolizumab uh, for the cytokine storm or uh, anticoagulant in therapy. So we haven't found the ideal antiviral so far yet. There was much uh, uh, publicity about hydroxychloroquine, and uh, but uh, the solidarity trial by WHO and uh, and studies from uh, UK have not shown uh, effective in uh, treating uh, the uh, virus. Uh, but we do have quite a bit of experience with hydroxychloroquine and we do have selected patients where it works. Uh, in terms of um, uh, prednisolone studies from US have shown that it's quite uh, um, helps patients with uh, mild to uh, moderate to severe uh, infection. Uh, it helps reduce uh, morbidity and mortality. Okay. Can we stop sharing? Uh, one second, sir. Or uh, one more question. Uh, Dr. Se Dr. Ananda Krishnan Sevaraman. Uh, yes, madam. Come on, sir. Can we stop the screen share? Okay. Yes, madam. Uh, normal size uh, prostate uh, with uh, PSA level is little high uh, and the frequency of maturation is, 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 is complaint. And uh, he was given a uh, Tamsulin uh, tablet, uh, Tamsulin capsule. Tamsulin. How long do you have to take the Tamsulin? And uh, what is your advice on this patient? So there are two different things, madam. Low urinary tract symptoms and high PSA. They're just You just have to I, I, uh, dissociate associate these two things. One is he needs to be treated for the LUX, which is Tamsulin for frequency because irritative low urinary tract symptoms, which is... Uh, Frequency, urgency, nocturia are one of the commonest signs of and uh, first signs of BPH. So that needs to be treated on its merits. If you start him on tamsulosin, you can continue him on tamsulosin for several years without trouble. But every six months, he needs to be assessed. And there should be a period where we withdraw the medication and see how he does without the medicines. And based on the size of the patient and so on. So when you say normal sized prostate, Again, there is, there is normal size alone doesn't make a difference. We have seen patients with uh, very small size prostate having severe low urinary tract symptoms and patients with more than 100 gram prostate oblivious to their size of prostate and having normal flow. So there are two components to this. One is a static component, which is the size of the prostate. Number two is the dynamic component, which is the tension that a person can develop in the prostatic fossa from the muscles. So the static component, we work on it by reducing the size of the prostate. That can be done by deuterosteride and finasteride that reduces the size of the prostate. Now the dynamic component is the tension in the prostate and that can be reduced by the stamcellosin, psilidocin and alkazosin. Every six months, we should assess how this patient is in terms of his lower urinary tract symptoms. And then whether we continue the medication or not is dependent on that. Now, regarding the PSA, if the PSA is high, the first step to be done is to find out whether there's a chance of him having uh, urinary tract infection. And if there is urinary tract infection, treat it. Right? Treat it. And one of the treatments is, again, if his pro is obstructed, you're giving tamsulosin. It's a very good treatment. And antibiotics. And then recheck the PSA. If the PSA is still high, he needs to have a multiparametric MRI. And then we decide on whether we need to do a biopsy or not. So two ways we deal with this. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So any other questions? No more questions means we can say a vote of thanks. By Dr. Uh, Sethi. Yeah. I'm here. Sorry, I'm Dr. Sethi. On behalf of IMA Punamali High Road, uh, I thank Dr. Anand Krishnan for his enlightenment talk on robotic surgery and the advantages of it and the best part of that he said they it reduces the stay in the hospital and maybe it is a little costly and I doc, I thank Dr. Kumanan Shanmugam and the beautiful presentation which gives us clarity uh, on and diabetes and uh, corona and then i wish to thank curie hospital and uh, all the support staff and micro labs and i thank all the participants who participated thank you
Thank you very much, sir. Thank you for organizing this wonderful meeting. Thank you, Dr. Jamna Rani and team. Yes, thank so you. From thank you. Hospital, thank I must thank all of you. Uh, thank, you. thank you so much. And Dr. Kumanan, thank, thank you all. You. Thank you all. Yeah, it's wonderful. a wonderful session. We enjoyed without seeing the time also. We have enjoyed. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you.